What's up, everybody? These are different kinds of victory horns, but they are victory horns nonetheless, as we welcome you to the UFC Vegas 88 post-fight show. And you know what? The real winners are those of us who not only watch this card, but watch this card from start to finish. We are the real winners. We are the real champions because, boy, oh, boy, did we have to go through a lot tonight. We're here to talk all about it. Thank you very much for joining us. I am Mike Heck. As you can see, going down the line, we got New York Rick. We got Alexander K. Lee. Boys, I mean, storyline central here at this UFC Vegas 88. So I'm just going to start right here because we know how this card ended. New York Rick ended with Martin Tybora doing the sad thing and handing Ty Tuivasa his fourth consecutive stop and loss submission in the first round. Who's the MVP of this card? Like when you think back, when Papa New York Rick is asked 30 years from now by his grandchildren, Papa, can you tell me about UFC Vegas 88? What do you remember? Because people keep asking me about it at school to go back and rewatch it on ESPN Plus or whatever streaming platform is around. Tell me what happened, what you remember most about that night when you watched this event live from the world's most famous apex. It feels odd to dub it MVP, but probably Brian Battle <laughs> because he gave the only like exciting moment of the entire night when he lost his mind over Angelusa, um, uh, you know, asking, uh, saying that he can't see in the fight being uh, called a no contest uh, for an accidental eye poke. It's the only thing I'll probably remember from this entire card. I mean, maybe I'll remember Marcin Tybora. Uh, Marcin Tar- Tybora's uh, submission over Tai Tuivasa just because of the skit it puts Tai Tuivasa on, but like Brian Battle freaking out is the only thing that got my you know my heartbeat maybe like five beats per minute faster. Uh, so yeah, I guess Brian Battle going wacko is is the MVP? Question mark. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> My best friend, uh, I thought maybe there would be a different punctuation mark at the end of the MVP question, but question mark was not what I was expecting, but I understand it. Who's your MVP? How will you remember this card? Which fighters stood out the most? Where are you at with this, AK? It's a bad card, man. It's not good. (laughs) Um, I'm the Prince of Positivity, but I also don't believe in BSing people. Like, this was rough, Mike. Uh, I'll answer your question in a moment. First, I'll answer your question with a question. In fact, it's a poll I just threw up. Uh, it's not really a question for you guys to answer. Of course, we watched all the fights. But I, I did want to ask the people, uh, how many UFC Vegas 88 fights did you watch tonight? And the options I gave were just the last few. So that could be main and co-main. could mean like the last four fights. Uh, the whole main card. Did you start from the first prelim? Maybe you hopped around here and there. Maybe you jumped in the first prelim and went to go do stuff, came back for other fights, just tuned out, had multiple screens on. I don't know. Uh, of course, um, started from the first prelim is leading the way, 42%. Uh, we do have a pretty hardcore audience, I know, that watches uh, this show. So that doesn't surprise me. But the other, I mean, the other options have a have a pretty healthy, uh, pretty healthy response too. So it does tell me that not everyone was completely keyed into all, what, 13? 13 fights on this card. Yeah. Ah, who was the MVP? Like, I'm kind of, uh, you know, Martin Tabora did a great job. I'll go, um, I mean, GM3, he quietly set a record. I say, I don't know why I said this a question. He quietly set a record, guys. Uh, the most finishes in UFC middleweight history. He is, he is, uh, or did he tie? Did he tie Anderson Silva? I, let me, let me, let me. Uh, wow. Yes. It's a very. That's legit. Game. He already had the most submission wins, which shouldn't be too surprising. I believe now he is tied. I have notes on this. I don't know why I'm referring to Wikipedia, which I don't need. Um, he is now tied with Anselva. Let me correct myself. He is now tied with Anselva. 11. 11 Damn. wins in the middleweight division with the GOAT. I think Silva, I think obviously if you count, uh, you know, he had some wins at light, uh, knockouts of light heavyweight too. So he'll still have the edge like a comparing their careers as people often do when they're talking about Andrew Silva and Gerald Mearshart. But yeah, that's very impressive. One of the competing at 185 pounds. No one has more finishes than him, Anderson Silva and, and uh, Mearshart does not look like he's anywhere close to stopping. So he very likely will break that record sometime in his next three fights. Uh, Cause he, he only finishes fights. He, Gerald Mearshart does not go to decisions with people. He either gets rocked and kicked and smashed or he, or he, he submits people. He's got a lot of those. So uh, there you go. GM three, you're the MVP. 
That was a good stat and a good joke. Mm, I, I heard the you. joke. You moved on a little too quickly. You didn't give us a little air to, to <laughs> acknowledge it, but good wow. joke too. Yeah. I'm with you, man. GM3, beautifully done. Uh, what's next for you? Uh, a beer and a nap. <laughs> Speaking my language. I mean, this man just singing right at the, pulling right at the heartstrings right there because beer and a nap just sounds... That, that's what I kind of want after this, watching this event from start to finish. And look, like, I see some people sort of mixed. Some people think it's a, it was a pretty awful card. I've seen, I see some comments in there that it was a pretty good card. Hmm. I'm not going to go that far. Pretty good is like a seven and a half or better. This is not a seven and a half card. Come on now. I think you're a little, you're a little out of control if you're going seven and a half card. Um, not too bad is probably where I would put it. Like, you know, how was your experience? Not too bad is probably like the best I would give this card. And it ended with marching Ty Bora. Ty Tuvasa I, comes out. Yeah, please. please, ask, Derek, what, please. <laughs> if this is not too bad, what would bad look like? Do they come oh, to God. your house and kneecap you while you're watching? What <laughs> What is bad? If this is not bad, what is bad? Dude, there are a lot. There's a lot of bad. Um the January Apex cards were really awful. The first okay, like two I don't even Apex cards, those, but I'll exactly, take your word. I'll take your word. We for didn't, it. we didn't have near fights at the end. We didn't have GM three talking about naps and beers. We didn't have comeback wins. We didn't have OSP multiple twenty eight parlay tickets, multiple twenty eight twenty seven cards, justifiably mm. so without a single penalty. We had. Uh, AK's heart broke emotional roller coaster with Josie and oh, Nunes losing oh. to Chelsea Chandler. Mike oh. Davis looked good in his return. Macy Chase on out here submitting people. Like whip two of the three women's fights ended in in first round stoppages. I mean, how many times does that happen? To, I just got you to hard sell this card. I'm I'm in. This was a great <laughs> card. This is this is a great card. And it was Mike, like not the, too bad. The one women's fight that I was I was like guaranteeing people was gonna end in the first or second round, early in the second, was the Josie Nunez Chandler fight. And that was that's the one that went to a decision. So we know nothing. That's the uh, uh, you know, always a good reminder to people. We don't know, we don't know anything. I yeah, clearly, because I, I told you because I, I took a parlay on the people's pre fight show and I was like, Yeah, you gotta do this, and then it was over. The parlay ended in what, a minute thirty eight? With Jacqueline Amber, yeah. <laughs> seconds. Jacqueline Amber, it should have ended Corey sooner. Get his arm home with her. Should have ended even sooner uh, if it wasn't for Mike yeah. Beltran. I don't know, being out to lunch for whatever that was. Yeah, that was. Yeah, awesome. dude, we're never gonna go back and rewatch this card. That that's plain and simple. But I think if you really look at each fight one at a time, and the things that happen, not too bad is probably like the best way to put it. It's not good. Wasn't the worst card. Not too bad. So let's talk about Mr. Not Too Bad, the man who headlines the Not Too Bad card of all cards. Marcin Tybora, New York Rick, comes through. This was a coin flip fight by the time we got to it. I think Tybora closes minus 115. Uh, no, Tuivasa closed minus 115. Tybora closed like minus 105. It's basically a flip of the coin. Tuivasa's doing Tuivasa things, lands some big shots, lands a nice elbow, slices open Tybora early. Tybora shoots underneath a Tuivasa right hand looks like he's going to get the takedown eventually just tackles him down and then the fight is just just a matter of time for Tai Tuivasa gets the WWF 80 submission arm treatment arm up in the air flat to the canvas fight is over and now Tai Tuivasa has lost four fights in a row What's the bigger story coming out of this? The victory for Machu and Taibora or seeing Tai Tuivasa, who people were saying after he knocked out Derek Lewis, just give this dude a freaking title fight. Like, let's just do it. And now he's been stopped in four consecutive fights. Uh, is it mean of me to say neither is a big story? Like, I don't think that either is a big story because, I mean, Tybora is going to get, you know, somebody maybe one or two spots ahead of him in the ranking or maybe one or two spots behind him in the ranking. And Tai Tuivasa is going to get a fight against somebody who will stand and swing with him and remain in the UFC, I would imagine. If not, I mean, I could see a world where Tai Tuivasa is elsewhere, but uh, and maybe at his own choosing. I don't know what his contract status is, but there's probably better opportunities for him elsewhere than the UFC where a lot of the heavyweights um, have a, enough of a grappling game to kind of neutralize him. Um, and he's not really comparable to Derek Lewis in the sense that like when people take Derek Lewis down, he just gets up 
You know, that's kind of the MO. He just gets up, and that's what Derek Lewis does. Tai Tuivasa does not have the just get up. Um, so, yeah, I don't know that there's a ton of of impact or stakes for either side of that coin. Maybe slightly more for Marcin Tibora, I would lean. Because, uh, again, Tuivasa, you, there's ways you can matchmake him quite easily. It's not going to be against top-ranked fighters anymore, but there's ways you can matchmake him quite easily and get exciting fights. I mean, for the first two minutes of it he was trying to kill Marcin Tabor he was trying to take his head off and being pretty successful at that if there are people who don't have the grappling end of the game uh as as sorted as Tybora does yeah that's a that's going to be a fun fight uh for somebody against Tai Tuivasa so yeah I, I don't think um like if you if you're somebody who expected Tai Tuivasa to be like a real heavyweight contender then yeah maybe it's it's time for your heart to be broken but I don't think there's many people out there I think there's a lot of people who knew um that in the right circumstances he could knock anybody out but you have to give him the right circumstances and these were not the right circumstances so not not a lot in either direction for either of these fighters but if I'm leaning one way or the other slightly toward Tybora cuz maybe he can climb a little bit I mean, I'm just going to put this up there because we talked about this earlier this week. This oh, yeah. is thousand percent the fight to make if we're going to do this. So let's just throw that out there if we're going to keep Ty Ty around. But AK, what's your what's your biggest takeaway, biggest storyline coming out of this main event? Uh, there isn't one. This this main event has no storyline. Um, that's not True. cruel to say because yeah, obviously to the fighters involved, it's this 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 meant a lot for Tai Tuivasa. This meant a lot. He he was very aware that he had lost three straight. You know, he's not he is the kind of, he's a he's a pretty happy go lucky carefree guy, but he, he takes his he takes his profession seriously. I, I do feel like he takes the profession seriously, and and he know, he doesn't want to go lose four straight fights, possibly put himself in the chopping block again. I think like a lot of people, I think we're pretty sure he's going to get another chance because there are fun fights that can be made. The Despain fight, if the UFC is interested in building up Robelis and, and feel like he could get a knockout of Tuivasa, they'll definitely make that happen. Especially since Despain is a bit up there in age. Like he's, I know uh, he is fresh to MMA, so you know he doesn't have that kind of in cage mileage on him. But he's still 35 years old, you know, in real life years, and and you you're gonna have to start giving him interesting fights sooner rather than later. Ty feels a little too soon for me. At the same time, if it happened. I don't think any of us would be surprised. I think we'd all be like, yeah, you got you to pull the trigger on uh, Robellus at some point. And uh, again, 35 years old, give him Ty, fan-friendly fight. Maybe Ty knocks him out. I don't know. But yeah, there, there really is no major storyline. And, and and I'm happy for, for Marcin Tabor, a guy who just keeps gritting and grinding away in the UFC, man. He's fought pretty much everybody. I think there may have been one brief moment where I thought like he could be one fight away from a title shot, but he's never been close. And, and maybe that doesn't matter. Uh, after tonight, he's 12 and 7 in the UFC. So he's just one short of 20 UFC appearances. It's very impressive. He's been in there with a lot of people. He hasn't picked up the big win that he's needed to make himself like a top five guy. He's been solidly in like the top eight to top 12 for a while. And as long as he keeps getting paychecks and he's not taking too much damage, they're turning into some hits in this fight. Uh, I'm sure he's a happy camper. So there are no real big storylines. Uh, maybe if we move down the card, we'll find some uh, threads to pull at. But no, I. <laughs> I mean, look, we can't, we, we really can't say that, uh, that anything of major importance happened tonight, but, uh, congrats to Tabora and condolences for Tuivasa, who, again, I, I still think we'll get another chance if he, if he has, if he has, uh, uh if he plans to stick around, I don't know, maybe he does want to pursue other things. Yeah. And, th and that was basically one of the things you, you just said is, is what I, what we were trying to tell everybody, like there are no stakes on this card. We are not going to talk about this card past maybe Ariel talking about it briefly at the top of the MMA hour and possibly interviewing one of the fighters on the card. Once that is over, we ain't talking about this card again because because there were no stakes, there were no storylines attached to it. But there were just going to be some fun fights and some fun, fun performances. And if you just sat down and watched it, like it would not be the worst thing you've done with your life in the last six months. So that's what this ended up being. But again, there's just no, there's no big storylines coming out of it. And the biggest storyline, perhaps, at least this is what New York Rick brought up, but we might as well talk about it right now. What happened in the penultimate fight on this card at 170 pounds? Brian Battle taking on Angelosa. This fight's getting real interesting. Brian Battle's looking real good. About a minute into round two. Brian Battle, I mean, knuckle deep inside yeah. the eyeball of Angelosa. I mean, this was a nasty cringe worthy eye poke it was bad 
Uh, it looked real bad. All the replays just made it worse. It made you feel worse about it. Angelosa can no longer go. He says he can't see. And once you say you can't see, there's no coming back from that. It's all over. It's all done. Fight is stopped. Both guys are kind of upset. And then we get to the moment at the very end where they're about to announce the, the winner. They look at each other. I don't know if they're going to shake hands. Maybe you can give each other a little dap. That didn't happen. The complete opposite happens. We have to get separated here. Brian Battle saying, I was beating the shit out of you. Then it's called the no contest. Angelosa gets ousted out of the cage. So he get doesn't get to say a word. Michael Bisping interviews Brian Battle. And Brian Battle just absolutely lets loose on Angelosa. Called them all the words I'm not going to say here on a live telecast. And Michael Bisping is like, Brian Battle, everybody. And Dominic Cruz basically on the mic is like, yeah, man, everything he said, I agree with. <laughs> Which is just like crazy to hear the commentator say. So, New York Rick. Your reaction to all of this, because this is a very weird and crazy thing. And I'll tell you what, despite a nasty eye poke and which leads fans and people in the sport to really kind of come down hard on you. Brian Battle took a negative thing and somehow has turned it into a positive <laughs> because people dug everything he said on the microphone. What a wild yeah. sport we, we are a part of. I've, I've been seeing online a lot of agreement with Brian Battle um, in this scenario. Um, my initial thoughts were, wow, that didn't expect that it escalated very quickly. Like the, as you said, they were kind of awkwardly after the, after the, uh, no contest was announced looking toward each other. And then as they're floating toward the middle to perhaps shake hands, Brian battle calls him a, 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 a nasty word that sets off uh world war three and they're going back and forth. Um, I just, yeah, I was kind of shocked to see it, but I do understand from Brian battles perspective, like feeling like, Hey, I was dominating that fight and you took an easy way, way out. And I'm now down a winner's paycheck and all the things that are associated with that. And again, one of the problems of, you know, the, the show win bonus thing, maybe there's some way to make, you know, both guys whole, but either way I can understand why with so much on the line, somebody like Brian battle, who feels like they were clearly winning that fight. Uh, would be frustrated and upset and feel like, you know, somebody was taking an easy way out. But if we can step back from the emotion, if we can step back from the heat of the battle, it was a very bad eye poke. Um, those moments are always a little bit dicey when it comes to the doctors coming in and, and can you see and can you not see? Um, he had five minutes, but he's being asked at the one and a half minute mark if he can see um it, it's always it's always an odd dance it's always a difficult situation the one thing you do have to know as a fighter obviously though is if you say you cannot see they are going to stop this fight so there is an element to the idea that angelosa knew what was going to happen and and tried to stop the fight or did not right like was just being honest in that moment and was frazzled and, and didn't know what to do but either way i understand from both perspectives i understand why losa would be like dude you are the one who shoved your finger to the back of my skull why are you upset with me that I, that I can't see? And I understand battle who felt like he was winning and, and an unfortunate circumstance, obviously accidental. I think we can all acknowledge that the eye poke was extremely accidental um, leads to, to the end of the fight. So just weird, but like a memorable moment. And hopefully they do run that back. I, I, I hope that, you know, they get another opportunity and, and to see, you know, what the, the real verdict of this fight is. And now there's a built-in storyline. We saw this with like, what was it? Kutilaba and who, uh, Ankaliyev. Ankaliyev. That's right. Exactly. So now we've got a, a built-in storyline. Run it back and, and let's see what happens. AK, what would you think of it? This could be, Mike, this could be Edgar Chires and Daniel Lacerda. You know, we could, again, <laughs> we're, we're, build, we're building anticipation because I didn't really uh, care too much for this Brian Battle and Lusa fight. Though, though I do think Battle is like a sneaky, you know, a future contender at 170 pounds. If, if he has a really good 2024, I could see us talking about him as like a top 10 guy in 2025, uh, 2025. And that's, that's, I mean, that's saying a lot, a lot has to happen. Um, and it was supposed to start tonight. He doesn't get that opportunity. Now he was looking good. If, if you, if you were to go to the cards, if you're able to go to the cards after six minutes, he would have won a pretty clearly won a decision. Things don't work that way. So yeah, we have to go to a no contest people. I don't feel like they need to take sides in this. Um, I know some people on social media, some of the fighters were certainly, uh, being pretty hard on Lusa, but, it, it, I just, uh, I don't think he was that deep in trouble that he would, 
and maybe I'm giving him too much of the benefit of the doubt, but that he would, you know, take a, a pretty rough eye poke and, and say, oh, well, I, I, that, that's it. That's it for me. Like I'm quitting. I'm out. Like there's a lot of ways for fighters to sort of get out of a fight as it were, um, that they're losing and a pipe eye poke. I get it. It's like, well, this is, you know, this is a way for him to not get an L on his record, but also I think he's aware of what people would think of that. I think he's aware of what he would think of himself if he took that way out. So uh, I choose to be sympathetic here. And I'm, and I'm thinking that Lusa genuinely could not continue and, and probably wasn't thinking uh, when he said, I couldn't see, probably wasn't thinking it was going to end right there. He should have known. He should have known. If, if, if you tell the referee, and you tell the ringside physician you can't see, they're doing the right thing by saying, okay, well, you can't see, that's it. Um, so if you're Lusa, you you kind of just got to be smarter if you are planning to continue and wait, you know, as long as they let you wait to see if your vision clears. Because, yeah, he probably couldn't see in that moment. But, again, you say it, the fight's over. So uh, this is very much like a non-controversy in my opinion. It kind of shows how little we have to talk about on this card that we <laughs> that we have to kind of make this into into something or that even the battle on Lusa had to make into something because if it wasn't for the post fight shenanigans, post fight antics and comments, uh we're just moving on. We're not even we're not even talking about this. But uh Battle Lusa 2, look for it uh at an apex near you this summer. I mean, they did us a favor, AK. That's one less fight we have to match make for tomorrow and on to the next one. So <laughs> yeah. You know the rules, everybody. They, there is no winner. Uh, we move on. It's like the fight never happened, and that's it. We're not even going to read fan submissions about what's next for either of these guys because that's what happens. That's the penalty you have to pay Yep. Uh, for that. Uh, Oban St. Pru just wrecking parlays across the world, having a fun third round with Kennedy and Suchuku. I mean, the old dog still has some tricks. OSP just getting done. And if you bet on Kennedy and Chichuku at like minus 650, wherever he was, yeah, shame on you. Shame on you. If you that. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't shame want to, you to say that. that. Uh, Macy Chies on quick submission, Gerald Mayer show we talked about, but the one, the other main card fight that people seem to be kind of back and forth on uh, Christian Rodriguez versus Isaac Dolgarian. And New York, Greg, I'll start with you. Isaac Dolgarian comes out looking like a future champion in the first round. He 10 eights Christian Rodriguez. He's tossing him around. He's beating him up. Round two, Isaac's still getting a lot of control, a lot happening, but he's not landing a lot of damage, but he had like four and a half minutes of control time. Christian landed like a couple of punches in the round, so people kind of torn on how to score it. And then round three is a 10-8 for Christian Rodriguez. Because Isaac Dolgarian, who has yet to see the judges' scorecards in his career up until tonight, just completely gassed out. Christian Rodriguez is a little bit tired, trying to defend everything as well. And we end up getting a Christian Rodriguez split decision win, all three cards, 28-27, which shout out to the judges for scoring the 10-8s on both sides. So I'm not going to say it was just a robbery, but your thoughts on how this fight was scored? Did the right guy win in your opinion? The right guy won because I had the second round for Rodriguez. So in that case, and and I had the first all three judges. I think we should break down how the how the judges had it. All three judges had ten eight for um Dolgarian in the first round. Uh two judges had ten nine for Rodriguez and one had ten nine for Dolgarian in the second round. And then all three had ten eight for Rodriguez in the third round. So not a lot of disagreement across the cards. The swing became the second round and two judges had it for Rodriguez. I had the same card, so I certainly agree with the decision. Um I thought Rodriguez just was busier and had more damage. Dolgarian wasn't doing much with the with the um takedown or not even the takedowns because he wasn't even really like taking down, but he he was obviously controlling um in that second round. And yeah, it's hard to kind of argue either way, like 28, 27, either way sounds right to me. Like that, that would have been the, the variety of scorecards I would have seen. Uh, Dolgarian obviously has a gas tank to work on, right? Like he had two rounds and that was it. And Christian Rodriguez, like for lack of better terminology and to lean into a cliche, like he's got that dog in him. He's not going to quit on himself and showed it in the second round and then in the third round completely took over it sounded like based on the broadcast that he had mentioned this in the fighter interviews and felt like he was going to take over in in the later rounds um and yeah he's he's a really well-rounded good fighter like christian rodriguez is an impressive guy because even in the fights where he's not coming in and like blowing the doors off or, or blowing your mind with what he's doing in there he really finds ways to hang around and win fights 
And I was just impressed with, with his ability there to overcome some real adversity in the first round. And yeah, Dolgarian, I think, has like a very obvious route to improvement here, right? Like if if you can put together a third round that's equivalent to your first, second rounds, like you're going to be a load for a lot of people to handle. So um, I think they both need, know what they need to do following this fight. It was probably one of the better fights of the night, if not the best one. And uh, yeah, I agree. I agreed with the judges. I don't I don't see much controversy here. AK, you are the the OG in robbery reviews. What did you think of this one? Did the judges get it right? Did you score for C-Rod? Did you score for Dolgarian? What do you think? I certainly wouldn't call this a robbery. Uh, I definitely can't. If anyone saw my uh, tweet of the score, I said 28-27 Dolgarian, but followed by multiple question marks. Just, it was such a uh, it was such a like clear first round, such a clear third round. Uh, and then there was just sort of the, that middle round, which in, apparently to a lot of people told a clear story it and it did to me at a glance, but I will say I was not generally on fight nights. I, uh, certain fights, especially I'm just not watching closely enough, maybe where I'm scoring accurately. So I went with Dolgarian tons of, tons of control time. Uh, but I wasn't paying enough attention, I think, to how much damage Dolgarian was or wasn't doing with this grappling time. I saw, I believe according to the stats and again, stats don't tell the whole story. Uh, Delgarian was credited with zero significant strikes in round two. Let me double check that real quick, guys. I don't want to. I want. I don't want to fake news all of you. Uh, significant I mean, that, strikes that would track. Right? I'm sorry, it zero was... zero uh, ground strikes. I'm sorry, zero significant ground strikes. I should say in round two. Yeah. So n and nothing he did on the ground uh, counted offensively, and that matters if you're trying to if you're saying the control time has won him that round technically it wouldn't because he didn't do anything with it again now again at a glance for me i thought Dolgarian won it um but uh, we had people i saw people online breaking it down uh my good my good man uh, aaron brosseter has a, has a tweet kind of breaking down what he thought he saw from rodriguez and he pointed out some strikes at the beginning of the round at the end of the round but i get it visually it's tough man it's a tough sell for fans to sit to see a guy like Dolgarian so aggressive in in control for much of that round top control um and then having to pick again a, a few Rodriguez strikes at the beginning, a few Rodriguez strikes at the end, and saying that's why Rodriguez won the round. And again, I don't think the judges necessarily got it wrong. That's a fair because that's the decision they're having to make uh, live, and it's really, really, really difficult. Um, so Dolgarian card for me, but after reading some other opinions on it, and again acknowledging I would need to watch that second round again, I don't think this is a robbery or a miscarriage of justice at all. It's it was it was a really <laughs> compelling back and forth fight. Uh, from beginning to end as far as like how it started one way and ended another way uh and then the third was just uh i don't know it's kind of it's kind of the whole discussion we're, we're frequently having on scoring right control time versus damage and it's supposed to favor damage but how much damage did rodriguez do is also open to interpretation yeah interesting fight and i'm interested to see what both these guys do after this that's for sure uh also interested to see what mike davis does after this comes back smushing the ton levy this fight was these guys were playing two different sports in there mike davis gets a submission in round two i i thought he could be the guy that does the thing and then he, he gets asked who do you want to fight next he's like oh man i don't care i'll fight anybody and then all of a sudden he's just like that he just names off four names and all of them are realistic they're all fights he could get probably not the patty one but that's like relatively around the same range but Patty probably won't take that fight. But then he was like Vince Pichel, Jim Miller, and like another name or two that I was like, oh yeah, these are all like very realistic. So Mike Davis, hopefully he could stay healthy and we could see a lot more of him. Chelsea Chandler gets a win. Jafel Filio gets a win. Uh, Danny Silva, split decision win. That fight with Josh Kulabau was as yeah, advertised. Good fight. Good scrap from both guys. Jacqueline Amarim, nasty submission, getting it done. Tiago Boyce's leg kick tko and the canadian chad and ellinger getting it done in the opening fight bonuses guys no fight of the night we predicted that we had like, we predicted that we, we did we did not uh, predict Jacqueline... and we did not predict any of the people who actually got one that's true <laughs> you're right you're absolutely <laughs> you whipped, right whipped it all how did Mike Davis not get a bonus? Uh, After all this time away, he doesn't get a freaking bonus. Can I guess? All right. Yes. He's, so do we have four? I'm assuming we have four. Do we have One, four? One, two, mm -hmm. three, four. Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down the card and uh, OSP? No. Uh, Tybora? 
Yes. Mirror Shark. No. I know, right? <laughs> I got nothing. I give up already. I mean, Moises, I don't know. I give up already. No. What? Uh, who, who is getting these bonuses? <laughs> um, Brian Battle. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Amarim, Filio, sure. Chiesan, Tybora. Yeah, man, GM3 kind of got hosed here, no? Kind of, yeah. Okay. Best, I mean, look. Best post-fight speech, the whole thing. There was a decent number of finishes, so it's hard to like really like go, oh, this person and not this person. But, I mean, I don't know. G the GM3 one felt like uh, like a winner, and so did Tiago Moises. But, I mean, congrats to all the winners. I'm not trying to take Mike any Davis money out too. of these pockets. Yeah, Mike Davis, too. Um, Okay. So OSP, the parlay buster, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing from OSP. He's like top. Like, he's like top three light heavyweight wins ever. I think. I mean, come correct. on. Yep. I know. Pretty wild. Pretty wild. All right, we'll go to the peeps now. I mean, I just don't know what else to really talk about here, so I'll let you guys sort of dictate it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we do have a couple of super chats. Uh, yeah. Like your Nike hat slaps. I want one. Uh, probably the most comfortable hat I've ever owned. What material what are my talking? first choice? Like what? What is it? Is it like I, a I nice even, mesh? I can't. Yeah. Does it breathe? It, okay. Oh, dude, it breathes. It's I tremendous. Like it. I nice and soft. It's like I'm not even wearing a hat. All right. So we like. Uh, Fahim wants to know: Can someone please tell me where is Hamza Chimaev? I wish I knew. I wish same. <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. Hopefully, we see him in Saudi Arabia. Well, I, I mean, imagine. Yeah, like it's uh, it's Ramadan and. Yeah, you know, we'll see, we'll see him post that, I assume. But yeah, it's his career is is puzzling to me. Like, I get don't don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not going to play dumb and pretend like there's not obvious like things regarding the visa that have been in play here. But I don't know, find a country he can fight in and bring an event there. Like, it just feels like Hamza Shamayev is a big enough name that we should have had more Hamza Shamayev fights no matter what it took. Um, and we just haven't. And it's really been a, del a hindrance to him getting opportunities that I that I think he would have excelled in. So, yeah, a weird a weird career for a guy who started his career as the yeah I'll fight twice in two weeks guy to now be never fighting. It's, it's a very odd scenario. Mike, there's like a follow up comes that question that came in. I'm not sure if you saw that in the super chat. Yeah, uh, super chat. Oh, it's coming yeah. up. There we go. Steven, boys, off-topic question. What gets you frothing more? Hamza versus Costa or Hamza versus Bo Nickel? Thanks for the shampoo tips last week, New York Rick. Yeah, <laughs> my man. Head and shoulders. Uh, I mean, look at these curls right now, by the way. Like, geez, can Louise, we, look at that. Can that's we just not, talk? That's not a filter? No, this is real. This it's is it. It's for realsies. It's oh, for realsies. Yeah. Uh, uh, what gets you frothing more? Hamza Costa or Hamza Nickel, New York Rick? No, go, oh, go, okay, okay, go, okay, go. Okay, yeah, okay. I'm ready. I'm primed. I'm ready. Uh, give me that. Give me that cost of fight. I still want that. I still want that cost of fight. It's been teased. It's been canceled. It's been this. We want this to happen for the chaos, uh, for the fact that, you know, cost is considerably higher ranked than the other option in this question. Bo Nickel, um, you know, we want to see Hamza face face legitimate. the wrong word. Face experienced and proven. Uh, middleweight contenders right now. It feels like a fight with Bo Nickel will be doing more for Bo at this point. And again, and we all think Bo has the makings of a future champion. Don't get me wrong. We're not saying if he was matched up with Hamza, the odds would be like shockingly close given their difference in MMA experience. It would probably, I think, I think, depending, depending on what happened with Nickel 300, I think Hamza would still be favored, but it would be like minus. I don't. You don't, I don't think he'd be favored? No, I don't think that at all depends on if he beats Cody Brundage oh. or not. I think the odds will be exactly oh, the same enough. if he beats Cody Brundage yeah. or whatever it happens well, I, at UFC I think, 300. But I do think if he if he like grinded had to grind out a decision against Cody Brundage, I think we're all expecting oh, him to finish. Boy. I think if he didn't finish him, I think that would change. The, the, the expectations for Bo are so out there, are so high. Like if he went to a decision, people are going, "Oh my gosh, you couldn't finish Cody Brundage." I didn't even. even I didn't even but, consider that that was a real thing that no, could actually no happen is. until you no just said is. at this moment. Actually. Everyone's <laughs> expecting a first round, second round finish, a 30 25 decision at worst. But yeah, even that could change the expectations. But yeah, Hamza would, would only slightly be favored. So that'll be down the road somewhere. I think we want to see that. Right now, I want the cost of business to be resolved. And again, we're killing two birds with one stone here. We're talking about another guy who's hard to get in the cage. So I'm kind of cheating. I'm kind of doing it just so we can get another cost fight and another Hamza fight in the books. Costa and Hamza have a good 
rivalry going. Costa and Hamzat are going to be way more dynamic, dynamic and exciting on the microphone. Bo Nickel, to his credit, uh, you know, not to his credit, but Bo, being realistic about Bo Nickel, he's a great fighter, but his mic skills are just not there yet. Like he's a little bit rough when it comes to that. Like he's better on talking, talking smack on Twitter than he is once the mic's in his face. Um, and so that's going to be there down the line, as AK said. Like, there's what's the rush with Bo Nickel? We we can get Nickel versus Hamza at any point. Um, let's let's try and do Hamza versus Costa right now for sure. Yeah, if that should be on the Saudi Arabia card, hundred percent. That should be a five round fight on that card. Yep, for sure, for sure. Sometime so, this summer, just yeah, anytime this summer, do that fight. Yeah, I love it. Let's just let's just settle that one. I feel like these we've been trying to pair these two guys up for like three years now. Let's just get it done, and whoever comes out of it, good and things will happen. And one more, if it if it one more shot at it, if it doesn't happen this time, I think we can move on from it forever. No more, no more, no more attempts to do it. Yes. Let's see. Uh, is Macy Chies on a title threat at one thirty five? She's won three in a row at one hundred thirty five pounds. Is she a title threat? Yes. Everybody in that division is a title threat. <laughs> Thank you. Here. That's no. the correct also, answer. Also, hold on. Also, listen. She didn't win three straight at one thirty five. This is a very That's this true. is a very cherry picking set. Yes, the last oh. three the last three times she fought under one hundred thirty five pounds, she has won. But this is reaching back to Mary and Renault, which happened in twenty twenty one, and Shanna Young, which happened in twenty twenty. The Irene Aldana fight, that's a bantamweight fight that happened at a catch weight. Come on, let's stop. What are we doing? We're not, we're just ignoring that. The Raquel Pennington fight was essentially should have been a bantamweight fight. So uh, I'll give you Norma Dumont. That's essentially a proper uh, featherweight wasn't, fight. So hold on. Wasn't the Pennington fight a featherweight fight and Chase on missed weight for that? That was a weird one because that actually, so I think both fighters, uh, not missed weight, it was supposed to, that was originally a bantamweight fight and then was changed to a featherweight fight when Raquel Pennington, I think, stepped in on short notice and somehow yes. Macy, who I think was the originally scheduled fighter, missed. Very strange. Uh, it was supposed to be, uh, sorry, Raquel and Julia Avila. Uh, Avila was replaced by Chieson and they changed it to 145 for that and still she didn't make it. So, but either way. Fair. Essentially, Adana essentially a bantamweight fight. Raquel Pantin essentially a bantamweight fight. Let's not say she won three straight. That's three in a row at bantamweight. Come baby. on, Eric. come on. Three Eric. in a row at bantamweight. But you're right, though. She is a contender. Yes, it's bantamweight. Guys, the women's bantamweight division does not have a long row of contenders. You need one win to get back in the winning track and one more win, and she's probably getting a title shot. That's to, really to, it. To give a genuine answer to the question, like, she's got some skills. Like, she's definitely, yes, like, definitely somebody who, who's got, who especially once it hits the ground, like it seems like she's, she's adept at kind of finding um, some openings there. So like, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it's out of the question. Um, but again, like anybody else could have a performance that's slightly better and they're in the, uh, they're ahead of the the line for a title shot. It's, it's, it's a rough division at the moment. I mean, we got a little mini tourney going on here. I mean, not to, not to give away too much on to the next one. Cause I know you're all thinking I got to wake up early Make sure I subscribe to the MMA Fighting Podcasting Network because I got to hear what my cat has to say about Macy Chieson's next fight. Uh, we talked about it on the People's Pre-Fight Show. It's a little mini tournament going on as we're climbing the ranks, and we got to do a little Macy versus Chelsea Chandler action next. Oh, the wow. two winners just battle it on and move on. I mean, where's where's the is Chelsea Chandler a title threat at 135 question? Because she knocked out AK's like number two she didn't make weight. women's okay, fighter so pound for pound. That, she didn't that make fight, she's never that, made it before. That fight gets booked. Do they, does one miss weight or do both miss weight? Here's what I Ooh, why not just let these women question. why not fight. just let these women fight at 145? No, because then you're not you're not going for a 35 pound this title is off that. Absurd. Why you're are not we going making for a 35 pound title? Why off are that? we making Macy Chiasson nope. and Chelsea Chandler cut weight? Why? Why? They're clearly 140. They can clearly fight for the 45 pound belt. They can <sighs> fight for the 45 pound belt after that, is, but they cannot so fight silly. for the 35. This is so silly. Making these making these women cut weight for nothing. Well, not for nothing. You're right. For probably a title shot. <laughs> The best. Next question. Next question. All right. Well, we'll throw this up there because this has been a big talking point today. Oh, yeah. um, Jose Aldo coming out of retirement to fight Jonathan Martinez. So the yes, there's the some reports. <laughs> uh, just that. It's not even a question. Just a statement. Uh, AG fight reporting. This fight is happening at UFC 301. So as you guys know, and we try to tell you all the time on heck of a morning, uh, the golden rule. If it's not on MMAfighting.com, it's not 100% done. It's not a thing. 
Like it's not officially a thing unless you see it on the website. Is this probably going to happen? It seems like it from conversations I've had. Have we fully all out confirmed this? No, but I have no problem at least bringing this up and playing a hypothetical that this is probably going to end up happening at UFC 301. So let's just say this is a done deal, New York, Rick. Let's just say this is a thing. UFC puts up a graphic right now. This fight is happening in Brazil. Jose Aldo, Hall of Famer, cup of coffee in retirement from the UFC and is already back. And he's fighting Jonathan Martinez, the silence behind the violence, fellow leg kicking extraordinaire in Brazil. Your thoughts on these reports that have come out today? Not just Brazil, but Rio. Uh, Rio, the king the, of Rio. The the dumbest possible fight that makes the most amount of sense that I've ever heard. Like just an absolutely <laughs> stupid fight that nobody needs to see. That is the only crumb of something interesting at UFC 301, which desperately needs something to care about in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Uh, and you're putting the King of Rio on it. So you could do worse than that. But yes, I mean, would I have rather have seen him fight anybody else at any other time if that could have been booked? Sure. But the UFC has backed themselves into a corner that cannot be that they, that they that they cannot escape, that they cannot get out of with how they've booked UFC 299 and 300 and even potentially 298 to now that they have zero left for UFC 301. They've got nothing left. They've got no Brazilian stars. And now they've got Steve Ursig versus uh, Alexandre Pantoja in the main event, which is not going to do anything for anybody. Uh, so you got to pull, you got to break the glass and pull the lever and call Jose Aldo to fight literally anybody. And Jonathan Martinez is literally anybody. So um, now let me, let me not, I'm trying to, it mean it means nothing in terms of the, the significance of the fight, the fight itself, the actual style matchup of Jose Aldo and Jonathan Martinez actually has me intrigued, right? Like that's a, that's Hell yeah. Jonathan Martinez is a bad MF -er, and that's a really kind of fun fight. It's just not the fight that I need Jose Aldo to come out of retirement for, right? Like if Jose Aldo was still competitive in that division and still fighting, great. I'm fine with that fight. But this is not the fight that you pull Jose Aldo out of retirement for unless you have an absolute emergency, which is that UFC 301 absolutely stinks to high heaven and you need the King of Rio to be involved in it. So there you go. Like it makes sense on in that regard. But yeah, I don't need to see Jose Aldo come out of retirement to fight Jonathan Martinez because that could have been a fight that was made when he was still an active fighter. Like I would have hoped it'd be some bigger name or somebody he has some kind of like rivalry in the past with or or some kind of other aging legend that's the thing that i would want to see jose aldo come back for but at the same time hopefully he gets the bag hopefully jonathan martinez gets the bag and they, and they put on a great fight because i do think there's a real chance like this could be a super fun fight it's just not what i'm looking for at this point in jose aldo's career boy does this just fit with the ufc 301 narrative ak <laughs> we were trying to figure out what the main event's going to be who is ali pants going to fight <sighs> And we're getting Steve Ursig, which, by the way, he's there. I don't hate it. I think it's going to be fun it. as hell. And I like the fact that Steve Ursig, who says nothing mean about anything or anybody and won't say a single mean thing about Alexander Pantoja, has gotten his way into a title fight just by punching people in the face. You got to love when that happens. This just fits the narrative here. Pants versus Ursig, Aldo versus the silence behind the violence, AK, this is just, I mean, this is main co-main event, simpatico. This is simpatico. Theme. Theme. Why couldn't Jelson Almeida just not guess, get Curtis Blades did <laughs> and just have him and Tom Aspinall on the top here? What a what an unfortunate, uh, uh, congratulations to Curtis Blades, by the way. Yes. What an unfortunate <laughs> turn of events for this card that that because that would have helped everything just kind of slot together so neatly. It would have been such a nice way to cap everything off. And then everything else that happens at, like before, we would have just kind of taken almost a bonus. We'd be like, oh, cool. Jose Aldo's coming back. Why is he fighting Jonathan Martinez? I don't know. Fun fight, but he's coming back. That's cool. Oh, Pentosha is defending his title against uh, Steve Versig. Steve Versig is a nice story. And and Pentosha doesn't have any fresh challengers besides like Makaya, who said he wants to fight Brandon Royal, blah, blah, blah. Everything would have slotted in. Now, now you see like the weirdness of UFC 301 is highlighted so much. And then even more so the weirdness of this Aldo comeback. 
I think I saw someone writing earlier in the comments, how much is like Jose Aldo getting paid to, to take this fight? And honestly, I, I would hope they're giving him some kind of bonus, but they don't have to, guys. You have to remember, this would technically just be, if I'm not mistaken, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, just fulfilling the last fight on his UFC contract. Because yes, he went to go do boxing, but that was with permission of the UFC. Because, uh, again, I'm to understand, he he left, uh, left, quote unquote, retired with one fight left on his UFC deal. And guys, there's no, there's no clause in the UFC contract that if you say, uh, I declare retire, I declare bankruptcy, you know, I declare retirement that you are now free from your UFC contract. That's not a thing. That's not a thing. So uh, yes, he's probably getting com coming back and getting paid nicely. I, I don't remember what he got paid for his last fight or if it was as close, but we're sure he's somewhere in the, in the decent six figure range, you know, should be making more, but whatever. Uh, I don't, I would, it would surprise me if he'd managed to get pay-per-view points out of this. Uh, if that would even matter, because I don't expect this show to do a blockbuster pay-per-view number, even with him on it. Um, but yeah, we should. I, I should be more excited about this, Mike and New York Rick. This is one of my probably one of my five favorite fighters of all time. I love Jose Aldo so much. I hated. I did hate kind of how his career, his UFC career, ended. Like the last fight of his UFC career, just did not was not what I wanted. So I should be excited. It feels like this is a second chance for us to say, you know, give a proper goodbye. Um, and I like Jonathan Martinez too, but it just feels so weird. Maybe it's because the, you know, the, uh, unfounded, by the way, guys, rumor of a Dominic Cruz fight is so much more interesting in my mind. I can't let that fight go. I've wanted that for so long. Um, but yeah, and, and I'm, maybe I'll warm up to when we get closer to fight night guys, but right now, I don't know. I, I just didn't have that warm, fuzzy feeling when I saw that all that was coming back to fight to the sounds behind the violence. Just kind of came out of nowhere. I don't know means god we're, when i hear that run this town tonight i'm gonna lose my shit i can't lie to you it it has the feeling that the ufc 301 card has it's yeah. just it's just another fight like that where it's like we know this did not need to happen for any reason other than it's in rio that's literally the only reason this fight is happening so yeah it is what it is this is still not as bad as blah muhammad versus gilbert burns being slotted in to be a co-main event on like 10 days notice for which led to nothing for, for it either party. literally nothing and, and i told you it was gonna lead to nothing and it didn't sell one ticket or yep. one pay-per-view not a oh, single th thing. this one on the other hand will probably sell some tickets potentially uh oh, for sure jose aldo and rio is jose aldo and rio but yeah not, by the not way I, I just saw a comment aldo definitely on that championship level pay and legend incentives Oh, oh, sweet, sweet children. I, I hope you're right. I hope I'm so wrong and I hope you're so right. But you got to understand the UFC doesn't have to do that. Again, th their their incentive could simply be, oh, you want to box again in the future? You owe us one fight. You fight in Rio, then your contract's done. That honestly could be the incentive. I want to I want to believe you guys are right. And they're giving him a little bit, a little sugar on top, but they actually don't have to. They could simply tell him, if you want to fight outside of the UFC again, you owe us one more fight and then you're free to go. That could be that. It could be it. It could be it. And if that's what it is, and Jose Aldo's fighting for that reason, means to an end, okay, good. Great. Now, sure. now he's a complete Great. free agent. Great. Works for him. Yeah. Uh, got some super chats. Matt, Mike, when's the golf video with Platt coming out? I believe you, yeah, Platt, as in Platinum, Mike Perry. Uh, soon. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Uh, it's coming Jeez. together. Jeez. It's coming together. It's uh, New York Rick got to look at a, a sneak peek. I did one of the rough drafts. It's uh, without the bells and whistles. It's gonna be a fun one. I had a good time rewatching the the rough cut. You will so enjoy it. Tuned. You will enjoy it. Uh, Fahim, what did you think of Ian's response to Colby's ten eight video? And three hundred one sucks so bad so far. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this. Ian, I did not. So Ian basically basically cut Colby saying like you have twenty four hours to respond. Like yeah. this is the ice bucket challenge instead of a fight call out. Yes. And Ian basically, it flashed to Ian. He was like looking at his watch, sitting in a pool and he was like, I'll respond on my own time. Don't rush me. That's literally the response. Uh, very Ian Gary response is my reaction to that. Like uh, yes. everything's just a, a one degree off from the, the, the <laughs> slickness that, that he believes it has and doesn't do it for me. The description yeah. of it sounds exactly like what I would expect. Um, and I, I did think it was interesting that Colby is finally acknowledging Ian Gary and seems like maybe he's uh, 
angling for a fight there. I, I, I rather liked the direction Colby went. And uh, yeah, that sounds like an Ian Gary response to me. When, yeah. when was this last week? Was this when I was on vacation? Please tell me this was when I was on vacation. What? I missed this Ian Gary the Col- Colby thing. No, this Colby, Colby did, I think it was like Wednesday or Thursday. Colby put out a video and it was like, you have to do these three things and then I'll fight you where it's like, turn yep. on your comments on Instagram some other there are a few other things there were some I, there were some crass uh requirements as well correct um and then he gave him the 20 you have 24 hours to respond and ian took far more than 24 hours and then was like oh, i'll respond to my own time colby <laughs> i see things so. just i see someone saying it's a timex sponsor you know what i miss whatever this is and i'm glad i did and, uh, <laughs> yeah dude it's, ha- it's happy to it's be uninformed it's everything you think it would be Goodness. and there you go. Uh, Joseph, thank you. In the preview show earlier, I suggested Paul Felder versus Jose Aldo at 155. Would that have been better? Rather have it be stateside, but it would save the card. So can you imagine if that was the freaking fight? Love at 155? that. 155. So have Jose Aldo cut back to 135 again to fight Jonathan Martinez. They can just do this at freaking 45. What's the, what are we doing here? Well, oh my gosh. I mean, maybe they can still do Martinez versus Aldo at like 45, right? Yeah, maybe they could thinking, say, yeah. um, I mean, this is not a ranked opponent for Martinez. Like, Hey, you know, just do this fight. We'll do it at 45. Neither of you guys has to suck yourselves down and, and you can do it, you know, at, at a, a more reasonable weight. I'd like to see that anyway. I'd like to see them probably give them a little extra weight on that anyway. Uh, but Felder makes a lot more sense as a name as an opponent for this, I think people would have been more excited about it again. It, I hate to take this route because it feels like we're shitting on Jonathan Martinez. I think it's safe to say like everybody here and everybody like who has actually watched this guy fight. He's freaking awesome. Like Jonathan Martinez is freaking awesome. I love that dude. I, I absolutely love watching Jonathan Martinez fight, but it's just not the fight I want for Jose Aldo. You know, Felder would have been a, a much more intriguing kind of interesting, you know, legend versus legend, veteran versus veteran look, um, even though I think Jonathan Martinez is clearly a better fighter. Yeah, con- congrats to Jonathan Martinez if he gets this fight. If, if this all, if this plays out and everything goes as scheduled, that's awesome. That's awesome for him. He 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 deserves to have big names on his resume. Yeah. I'd prefer if it was, again, names that were not being dragged out of retirement. That's uh, but, if that, but if you're Jonathan Martinez, you don't really care. You're, Jonathan Martinez does not see this as like, oh, I'm fighting retired Jose Aldo. He just says, I am fighting Jose Aldo, one of the greatest fighters of all time. And if I have that in my resume, that's there forever. This is why Patty wanted to fight Tony Ferguson, right? And Tony's certainly not in the same form as, as Jose Aldo was like near the end of his career. But Patty will always point to like, oh, I have a win over Tony Ferguson. I have one over Tony Ferguson. And we know the circumstances around it. But guess what? It's still there. Uh, Jonathan Martinez beating Jose Aldo would be much more meaningful. But yeah, s- s- same idea as far as like, if you're him, you're happy to take this fight. Aldo, again, we don't know the full motivation. Maybe there's a big paycheck in there. Um, but uh, yeah, we don't, we, again, we don't mean to crap on it too much. It's, it's, we'll, we'll, we'll we be excited. Love, we love Jonathan Martinez, but, and then dot, 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 but, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot, of, like, I, I see a lot of comments and I saw on social media too. Um, Dominic Cruz rumors or whatever. Um, even some people were actively throwing it out. Like, you know, Dominic Cruz said no to Brazil. Um, hmm. Again, I don't know all of this. I'm just going based on the conversations I've had. Conversations I've had are that the Dominic Cruz idea was a Twitter idea um, that may have, have had some validity, but from the conversations I've had, it's a Twitter thing that just got so popular that everyone started by, like believing in it so much that it like took on a life of its own. Um, from what I understand, Jonathan Martinez has sort of been the guy for this idea for several days now, uh, even as like the beginning of last week was in play uh, as of like Wednesday or Thursday, the fight was like officially offered to him like middle of last week. And then, you know, where I were at right now, I don't know if like Penn is hit paper, but it's probably going to happen. So that's kind of where we're at right now. There you go. But yeah, that, that uh, Jose Aldo is fighting in the UFC octagon in two months time right now. That uh, like X can uh, create expectations that become unrealistic uh, once they get out of control. It can, it can happen. It can absolutely happen that way. So man, who knows? Look, if Aldo goes in there and does the damn thing against J Mart, 
we could still do Dominic Cruz if we really want to. It's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. But yeah, that was a little surprising piece of business that we got today. What else do we got? Do we have anything else? Crazy that Martinez dropped three spots last week in the rankings. Did he? I didn't even notice that. Did some Not guys... in the only rankings that really matter. <laughs> so I guess there some you... guys must have jumped over him is what yeah, happened. Kyler, even... Kyler Phillips oh, probably, sure. probably bumped him down. The uh, silence behind the violence is in our rankings, right? I believe so. I believe he is, yeah. Yeah, TSB TV better be. Let's take a, let's take a quick look here. I, I'm, I'm fairly certain he is. Uh, we have Jonathan Martinez uh, tied for 15. Right? He's actually tied with Kyler Phillips at number 15 right now. So, All right. Hey, listen, and just being in the top 15 in our rankings, considering it's not just the UFC, it's like all the bantamweights. Mm-hmm. It's pretty that's That's not bad. That is not bad. There's a lot of freaking good band. Where's Jose Aldo? I'm well removed due to unranked retire- retirement. Yes. Uh, right. The second he steps into that octagon, I'm immediately ranking him. <laughs> I'm immediately ranking him. If he beats Jonathan Martinez, I'm going to make him. He's jumping above Umar. If he beats that? Jonathan Martinez, I mean, respect. It, you kind of do have to rank him at that point. I mean, that's a, oh, dude, that's, he's, that's a sick He's going to be ranked. He's going to be ranked anyways. That's for sure. Uh, Giovanni, thank you. I wanted to clarify that when I voted since first prelim that I'm a barber and we have them on at work. So I paid, oh. it, I paid attention 33% <laughs> until the OSP fight. Oh, okay. That counts as a hopped around. I feel like that counts as a hopped around. I don't feel like that counts as started from the first. I feel like that's he's, a hopped around vote, not that's a, a hop around. I think he's acknowledging. It. He's okay, acknowledging. Okay. Yeah, All that's right, basically understood. what he's saying. He's saying, yeah. look, there's one extra vote for that. Put me back in, in the hop around. Yeah, let me let me close the poll now. Uh, right now it's at uh, 30, uh, from the first prelim still one third, but it went down to 32%. Uh, and then that means if you guys want to do some quick math here, 78% Declare are saying they did not watch the fight from card, uh, the card from top to bottom. But I, I also have to imagine that's somewhat normal for any, uh, non pay-per-view. I would, I would imagine most pay-per-views you have maybe like uh, of our viewership, maybe 60, 65% would say they watched in the first prelim, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, maybe this is a particularly bad result, uh, for a fight night card. It wouldn't surprise me if it was, but 32% said they stuck through. So. Um, but again, this is this is also a hardcore viewership. You know, I wonder if you took the more casual viewer, it has to be majority tuned in for like the main card or maybe a little bit earlier. What are you what it. are you counting as a casual viewer? Not someone who listens. I, I'll tell you, not a lot of people who listen to our post fight show, uh, uh, New York Rick. I, I feel like we attract the most intelligent, sophisticated, and uh, well studied combat that, sports viewers. That part I agree with. Yes. If we're t- if the word casual is involved, I would say zero percent of this card they watch. Oh. Like there's not a casual person <laughs> oh, fan wow. alive who watched this card. <laughs> you have to be hardcore. Even if you've watched just the main card, you are a hardcore <laughs> MMA fan for watching. That. <laughs> I, so. I, I will tell you, I will tell you right now. If I didn't have to work it, I would not have watched a second of this card. Yeah. Not one second. I would have watched the players, and I would have went out on a beautiful day with the family. That is for a hundred percent fact. Would I have watched it like tomorrow? Perhaps I would have found like the good things to watch, but yeah, that's I mean, it's just the nature of the beast, you know. It's just the nature of the beast. This isn't a great card. Next week, whew, great, pretty solid main event. There are at least some stakes there because anytime Rose Namunis is involved, if she wins, she could shake everything up. But boy, is that a tough hang in terms of like stakes and meaning. And what makes it worse is that it's a six fight main card that starts at 10 p.m. Eastern next week. Come on. Oh yeah, dude. Come on. Oh yeah. What yeah. The, what are we get a doing? Good night's sleep. Get a good night's sleep on your Friday. Uh, Michael, hopefully Pereira could turn around for 301. I don't know if you're talking about Alex or Michelle. Uh, if you're talking about Michelle, you get your wish. And we're going to break a little bit. I guess we're breaking some news for you. He is fighting at 301. If you're talking about Michelle Pereira, he's fighting Mahmoud Muradov. I think he um, means Alex. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I don't think it's going to happen though. I also don't think like this, this is, we're at the point now where you can officially write this card off and they're not going to yeah. invest a single extra moment thinking about this card again. They're going to say, we're taking a bath on this one. Well, okay. I, we should make this maybe clear. They're going to get paid by ESPN for putting on this card and that's all they had to do. 
Tens of millions of dollars, by the way. Yes, they are putting on this card and it will do a very low pay-per-view buy. They have a floor established with their broadcast partner where they get paid no matter, uh, they get paid as if the pay-per-view did X number of pay-per-view sales. Anything above that, then they share profits and they they that that is what they're aiming for, right? They are aiming to exceed that. But when they have a pay-per-view like this, where it is not going to do well, they're still getting paid. And so they're not going to invest money when an Alex Pereira fight, depending on who it's against, probably isn't going to raise that ceiling too much unless it's like, hey, we're doing Izzy again, or there's some like crazy fight that really does like elevate the pay-per-view. They have no incentive to do that. They're going to count this one as a, as a bad uh, booking. We blew our load on 299 and 300. We're going to move on and focus on 302 and beyond. So I don't think, I don't think they, they are going to put Alex on this card no matter what. Yeah, no, they, they don't need to. They don't need to. It, it, it's they, there's going to be some scenes too. Let's be honest, there's going to be some nice positive scenes. You know, if if three or four Brazilians win in the prelims, you get the crowd fired up. I th- I would think they expect Pantoja. What I, I would think, and they don't often book title fights this way. One of the reasons they picked Ursek is because they think Pantoja will take care of business. Mm. Um, and I agree. And, and I and, and that's no disrespect to Steve Ursek because he could very likely play the spoiler as he has in a couple of UFC fights already. And really send people home unhappy, uh, but I would think Pantoja will be at least like a minus two fifty, maybe minus three hundred favorite. Uh, especially considering the public reaction to the main event announcement, I think a lot of people just still don't know who Steve Urseg is. Um, even though anyone who's watched his three UFC fights or watched him before the UFC know, like, oh, this guy's legit. Like, this guy probably is good enough to fight anyone in the top five. We just didn't expect him to get the number one guy so quickly. Um, so I, 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 I just kind of defend to defend the. Experience where like we like to see, yeah, we've talked about it, probably not gonna do a great peer review, might not even sell out, but the product and like the clips they're gonna get from it will probably be very useful to the UFC because I think you are gonna get some big moments for for Brazilian fighters, and that's all you gotta do is string those together and talk about wow, what a triumphant return to Rio for uh for the promotion. It has the oh. vibe of some of those recent Canadian cards where it's just like if enough wow. of the hometown fighters win, you you kind of get you're taking you a know, shot? You catch fire. You're taking a shot at me, New York Rick, talking about UFC two ninety seven, you take a shot. Huh? I mean, all the I'm men, the all the men going on five. What's that? What are you doing? What are you doing? I'm right here. <laughs> to my the face. Best laid plans. Best laid plans. Yeah, that <laughs> one didn't go so hot, but uh, the one before that felt felt big, oh, yes. felt yes. special. Yes. It did. Um, and and I feel like the booking is similar. Good on you to point out. Like I do feel like the <laughs> the vibe in the arena is going to be a lot different than what this does on yeah. pay per view, which is going to be absolutely nothing. Yeah, dude. Filio won tonight. He's from Brazil. Amarim won tonight. Brazilian. Tiago Moises won tonight. Brazilian. They should make it one a of those fighters. Thirty fight card, card with all Brazil versus <laughs> people, and then just see Dude, if you part- can see if you can string enough together that it just is impossible for Brazil to lose. There's so many Brazilians, they just kill it, and then everybody gets excited. <laughs> Dude, they couldn't even hold Renato Moicano off for three weeks to <laughs> have him fight in Brazil. <laughs> him fighting Jalen Turner yeah. is cool as cool as hell. I yeah. love that fight. It's tremendous. But we couldn't wait three weeks. It had to be at 300. I I don't understand that. Just back, like, overthinking them, like, themselves into a corner, which is crazy. Well, they had it. They had it when they had Alex and, and Jamal, and they just... Oh, for sure. They blew yeah. it up on purpose. Like, they had... The, this would have been fine. They needed Alex and Jamal, Perfect. and they blew it up on purpose to headline 300 for some reason. For no reason, which yeah. they didn't even have to do. Nope. Uh, Fahim, I didn't watch single fight tonight, but I'm watching your show. What does that tell you? It tells you you're a very smart man. You got all everything you needed and more. And we got to talk about Jose Aldo potentially coming back and fist fighting somebody. And that we love you, Fahim. Yes, we do very much. Michael, how do you feel about uh, Alan v. Curtis 2? Yes, that uh, went down. Marvin Vittori suffered what he called a freak accident so he is not fighting brendan allen at the world's most famous apex on april 6th the go home show for the aforementioned ufc 300 and stepping in on short notice chris curtis who holds a stoppage win over brendan allen though i believe he is the the last man to defeat brendan allen was he not before brendan allen went on this incredible streak winning the middleweighty middleweight title and probably vacating it because he's too good at what he does at this point vacating uh, winning and then vacating it yes you're so correct. what do we think new york rick chris curtis stepping in 
to try to go 2-0 and against Brendan Allen and stop this long winning streak and just kind of knock Brendan Allen out of title contention altogether. It stinks for Brendan Allen because I think he was trying to advance, right? I, I think he was trying to move up, and this is another one where I, d- I don't think it's going to do much in the stock. But I think it will be good for Brendan Allen to have an opportunity to get that one back. And for Chris Curtis, it's another opportunity to kind of jump back into the fray. And one he called for at several points. And I think uh, stylistically, it's it's a fun fight too. So I don't hate it. I do feel a little bit for Brendan Allen. Like it just, it's it, it, it's not doing what it needs to do for his purposes. But get, good on him for being game and, and taking it and, and saving the opportunity. AK, you're a big uh, Chris Curtis I like guy. It. Yeah, I'm, big Chris Kurt- I'm, big, I'm a big Chris Curtis guy. I like it. I feel a little bit bad for Brendan Allen because he's, wanted the Sean Strickland rematch for a long time. Uh, obviously, that kind of went out of play when Strickland became a UC champion and kind of moved into another tier of, you know, the division. But he, that's, that's the rematch he's wanted. Uh, I'm sure he loves, he's loving the Chris Curtis rematch too, but he really wanted to get Strickland back. Uh, instead, he gets Strickland's uh, close friend and teammate, Chris Curtis. So there's a lot to lose here. And I do think Chris Curtis is still a very dangerous matchup for him. Uh and it, it is it is always good to be able to get that one back in your record. If he beats Chris Curtis, then he's avenged his only loss in the past nine fights. So it's not like he's on a nine fight win streak, but in his mind it would kind of look that way in the match because you kind of sell it that way, sell it that way to the fans, and that'd be really impressive at, at one eighty five, a, a division that uh, Mike you have said has, has improved greatly over the last couple of years as far as um, how how deep it is. Uh, so love the matchup. It's a fine fight night main event. No problem with it because it does have a little bit of a storyline to it. But I, I, I kind of still wish we could see Brendan Allen and Strickland 2 down the road, even if it that ended up going uh, the same way as his, his first fight with Strickland, which is good. Look, we don't know what's going on behind the scenes. I don't know anything, but let's just say, New York, Rick, you, you are Brendan Allen's manager. And they this these are the options. They could say, hey, you can still fight on this card in the main event against Chris Curtis, where the only thing you really gain is like something for yourself where you could extract revenge for a loss. You didn't feel was, was right. You could try to right a wrong, but you really gain nothing from it. Or you wait 80 days and we rebook the Marvin Vittori fight, same venue, still a main event. Do you do that? Or do you take, do you roll the dice here? I think you roll the dice for one. You're maintaining a UFC main event, which I think is significant and I think it matters, right? When the UFC is looking around and going like, how do we elevate people? I think having a number of UFC main events matters. And so I think even just the idea of maintaining a main event is worth it, is worth the risk uh, potentially for Brendan Allen. As we mentioned, there's a little bit of a storyline as well. Also looking at the UFC rankings, like Allen is six, Vittori is five. So it's not like this catapults him, right? If he had maintained this matchup with Vittori, I don't think it catapults him. I do, again, I think we all wanted him to fight Vittori because we also think of Vittori as like a perennial kind of contender, top guy. Chris Curtis is not that, right? Chris Curtis is some, somewhere lower down that that tier and lower down that ranking. And, and a win over Vittori puts Allen in a different kind of category. Now he can start calling for Sean Strickland. Now he can start calling for the guys above him. Um, but I don't think it does enough rankings-wise that I'm trying to sit on it and hold it and make that the plan. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't pin my hopes to Marvin Vittori specifically. I think it's enough to say I'm going to keep a main event. The UFC is going to look at me and go, "I'm game. I'm willing to save their cards. I was in the main event. I'm still in the main event." And then just go from there. Um, so I think that's enough. If I was, if I was managing uh, Brendan Allen. Fair. I, 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 what do you, I, I agree. I, I can understand where you're coming from. Do you agree, AK? Yeah, I, I I think this is a way uh, for him to uh, you know possibly avoid the uh, Vittori fight altogether. Not not that I think he's trying to no do that. No chance. Uh, yeah. Um, no. Nope. Oh, you think he still has to do it? Yep. Oh yeah. Oh okay. It's I'm sorry. I, I I misheard. I, I I thought you said that uh, that the, he's not only maintaining a main event, but maybe by winning a main event and you know kind of uh, keeping the streak going with uh, the current form he's on, that the UFC be like ah well we don't need to do the Vittori fight now. Well. Uh, you just have to it's, look at the names. Yeah. Like, it's Strickland, Adesanya, Whitaker, Cannoneer. Mm-hmm. They're not fighting Brendan Allen, so you really got no options there. Cannoneer yes. is maybe his best chance, but even still. It's not automatic, but I do think him getting uh, – if he gets an impressive win over Curtis, I do think him like that, that, that they found someone for him to save this main event. 
it could i do think you're gonna pass the vittori fight um because we've said a lot of times i think especially in this division right now middleweight because we said like like what shamayev and costa you're talking want to read books stuff like that we've said like how uh I don't know. Like w- winning these fights do- can change your trajectory a lot. Like I remember, I thought that uh, Hamza after he beat um, Usman, I thought like I thought I still want to see him fight Costa. But there's no guarantee that that gets rebooked. Like it seems logical, but we also hear oh he beat Usman and now like they're talking about Hamza for maybe a welterweight title shot. Like they want that. <laughs> it's so weird. It's so strange how these things work. So I, I am not ruling out the possibility that if he beats Curtis in impressive fashion, that uh, the Vittori fight. Uh, might get pushed aside at least for the near future because you're, right, you're the guys you named you're right, are not going to fight Brendan Allen next. That's what I'm but saying. A, for who? But though? a lot can let's change in the next not six months. Vittori. Yeah. Who is it? Because it's not a lot, any of those guys. A lot can change in the next six months. So yeah, let's see how. Because I think some of the guys, uh, the names you mentioned are books too, right? So we have to see how they do, uh, and then they might make more sense for Brendan Allen than they do now. So I, I get it. I get it. But uh, I do think he can he can bypass the Vittori fight if he plays his cards right on uh, on April sixth. Boy, and if Chris Curtis somehow wins that fight. Oh, man, that's a whole other thing. That is tough. That is tough. Brandon Allen's road to getting to a title fight is so long. If that happens, it's so, so long. So I guess there is some risk, but even if he wins, he it's high risk and super low reward. That I agree I, with. The main event is the only real like thing that I'm pegging on for this one is like, yeah, the UFC looks at you and goes, "Okay, you're a main eventer and you're reliable." That's that's what you kind of hope for. Yeah, Fahim is 300 missing fighters ending their names with V. <laughs> Dude, this is the best. Like, look, is I that- understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I he. It's a lot of 300 questions and Shemaev and you know what would happen if this wasn't Ramadan? What would yeah. 300 look like? I do think. It would not be Alex Pereira versus Jamal Hill. We're probably looking at Islam trying to fight for a second belt. They, that would probably do Leon versus Islam. That would be my guess. But there's Ramadan. Or there's Hamza, all that. Hey, there's Hamza a lot of would, different guys. Yeah. A lot of people you could possibly do here. But still, even with what they have, this is, in my opinion, top to bottom, the best card the UFC has ever put together. Ever. Ooh. It's up there. It's, it is it's, up there. If it's. From the first fight to the last fight, this is probably the best card that I've ever never done. Ever. I've never dug in on this. Here's what I would say: There's a chance you're right on the basis that at the time that some of these other cards were made, the ones that have aged better, right, weren't as good. Like you think about these cards, and then you're like, "Yeah, well, it had John Jones on the prelims, but yeah, like John Jones wasn't John Jones, so they kind of have aged better. Like the the, the benefit right. of hindsight has made them age better. There is a chance, like this moment right now it's it's better because everybody here is like relevant significant ranked every single one exciting great um but man that's a that's a big statement i've i've not thought about it i'll be honest because i'm just like this is like water in a desert like these cards have just been so absolutely dreadful that like a card (laughs) as good as 299 and 300 just feels like mana from the heavens for me like i'm just like oh thank god oh my god it's coming to me and um i don't even think beyond that like i'm just so thankful that this is even happening that i've been blessed to have good mma in my life and so i haven't thought historically maybe it is i mean there's a chance i I would say probably not i just can't imagine that there hasn't been anything better but it might it might be up there you might be right Dude, it, we're it, opening with figgy and yeah but that's kind of a, again that's know, kind of a no, gimmick right bo nickel Bobby versus Green. Cody Brundage is is not some like legendary fight. Like you could swap that with with Cody, and then the the quote unquote opening thing doesn't mean anything at that point. Yeah, they kind of screwed the pooch for me because um, I I actually defended the bow nickel on the three hundred main card. Um, I give credit to Damon Martin for getting me there, but only in the position that it was before tonight because they changed the order and they put Oliver Saruki in second on the main card and they put Bo Nickel Brundage first on the main card. And I get it's sort of the same direction, but I liked Bo Nickel Cody Brundage in that spot because the next fight after that is Justin Gaethje versus Max Holloway. And which fight is going to guarantee us that we are going to get to Justin Gaethje, Max Holloway as quick as physically possible. It is Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. (laughs) That is why. Then there's no more waiting. Fight ends, Bo cuts his promo, and then we're running the promo for Gaethje and Holloway, and there's nothing else left. Maybe there's a Hall of Fame 
recap or maybe we're announcing somebody else or we're promoing 301 and we're seeing what other weird fights they put on that card. But then we know that the next two men who are about to walk into that octagon are Justin Gaethje and Max Holloway. But now you got Bo Nickel, Cody Brunge going first, which means we're going to start it with a finish more than likely. And who knows what's going to happen with Oliver and Sarukin. They might go a full 15. It's not going to be a bad fight. But you know what I mean? It's kind of like the let up spot and then we get right into the three title fights. It's well reasoned, super sharp. Appreciate you putting that forth. Card placement does not matter at all in MMA. Oh, I, yeah, I forgot who I was talking about. Mr. Card Placement himself. <laughs> but still, th- that was the only reason why I liked it. I'm like, because I just want to get to Gaethje Holloway. Let's go. Let's throw these two dudes in there. They could fight for 45 seconds. It could be over. And then we get right to the bread and butter. So, yeah. But dude, that's like great. 300 is that's sick. the least significant fight on the entire card. Yeah, but it's there far. for a reason. Yeah, by far. It's there for a reason. Um, It would have been nice to have like a Islam, although, uh, you know, it, it just I don't think that was ever like really in play necessarily just because of the, the Ramadan aspect or a Hamza or somebody with a with a V on the end. Uh, But it's hard to be mad at anything that's happening with 300. No. 300 is it's, sick. All these fights are bangers. They're all great. Uh, a couple more super chats. We're going to get out of here. Terrence Jelton made it back at 205 with another loss. Why not now? Um, I was going to say, why does he need another loss? Uh, go, I, I, man. I, go now. <laughs> it might be a little too late. It's never too late. It's what do you mean too late? late? Dude, tell have me, you tell seen me. what this man looks like? Did you see oh, what he looks like? Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. Dude, I he get it. bulked up. Like he's not, he didn't, uh, he's he not, can drop it. that's beach. That's uh, that's beach muscle. No, popcorn muscles. No, 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 no. Muscle. He'll be, no. he can go back. No, he does. Dude, you know what? I didn't think about that. Not, he looks fucking yeah. big. Yeah. Dude, he was like 241 and he was like getting bigger on the scale. Yeah. Like you can see his muscles getting bigger on the friggin' Listen, scale. This dude is not, not a light heavyweight who just is fighting a heavyweight. He looks I like saw, a freaking heavyweight. I saw Alistair Overeem once uh, hopped up on <laughs> horse meat looking like the friggin' Incredible Hulk. And now he looks like a welterweight in, in retirement. So I'm sure it's possible for Ch- Jelton with a, uh, to put it nicely, change in diet to shrink back down to 205. <laughs> so please. Yes. Uh, so I'm lose, not ruining that at all. Lose 40 pounds of muscle, Jelton. You can do it. I people believe have in done, you. People have done stranger things in combat sports. All right. Dude, and, he's uh, about I to go. He's about that. to headline. He's about to headline at the world's most famous apex at some rando card in August against Marcin Tybora next. Yes. He's got a cap. Right. He's going to have to put on more muscle now to try to chuck that dude around. <laughs> oh, I, Lord. Okay. I'll say this though. Realistically, I like his chances against the top light heavyweights way more than I like his chances against the top heavyweights. Um, and I'm talking specifically like the real top, right? Like I'm talking, is he going to win a championship? I don't like his chances against the really, really top, top guys. Um, whereas at light heavyweight, I think it could be more competitive. And especially with how hard they hit. We even like, we, we literally saw this play out with the Curtis blades fight. It's not like Curtis, like went in there and starched them. Like he was completely controlled, but when it's heavyweights, if you're just sitting there shooting for takedowns and grabbing on legs and don't have much of an offensive top game, you, there's a chance you really just get pounded out by a guy who's 265 pounds. That's just what heavyweight is. I like his shot a lot better at light heavyweight, but I don't think you're wrong, Mike. Like he may have just become a heavyweight, and there's just not like a turning back point where you kind of got to stick. Yeah, he ain't beating Tommy Aspinall. But no, He's Tommy Aspinall. Tom Aspinall would dust him in 40 seconds. Like it wouldn't even be a competitive fight. Yeah. Uh, Steven, question for AK. Uh, oh, then we goodness. have one more after this. Uh, who is the next Canadian standout, and why is it Chess and Justin <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I still have hopes for Mike Malott. That, that was a big yeah. jump up in competition for Neil Magny. I think a lot of us picked Magny to beat Mike Malott because we just said, look at who they fought. Look at look at the level of competition. That matters a lot. Um, and, and Malott actually looked good at moments in that fight. It's just, you know, you're facing a guy who's a lot more experienced, who's been in the deep waters, who's not going to panic if you, like, get a little offense on him early on. So Mike Mullot's still up there. Um, not that he's, like, a super young prospect. I think that is sort of the misconception about him and, and some of the other... If you look at a lot of the fighters in the Canadian scene who have good records, uh, they're kind of up there. They're, like, in their 30s. And if they're they're not heavyweights. They're not heavyweights, not heavyweights. Like, they're in their 30s in divisions like welterweight, lightweight, featherweight. Um and again, I don't want to judge anyone on life age. I do think in cage mileage is probably more important, but it's just hard to be considered like a blue chip up and coming prospect when you're when you're up there in age in the lighter divisions. Like that's just a fact. That's just a reality of the situation. Again, I hope Mike Malott proves me wrong 
and bounces back from this Neil Magny win. We see him win four straight and talk about him, you know, contending for a title someday. It's certainly possible. But um, the MMA scene up in Canada is rough, man. It just, it just didn't, it just didn't develop. Why is that? What, what happened? It just didn't develop as a lot of us had hoped when it was legalized in Ontario. That was supposed to um, start this golden age of MMA events. And we actually had a good amateur scene before that. But then that happened, and then the amateur scene kind of died off because I think some people started chasing pro money. But then the pro scene got screwed up by uh, there was a lot of red tape required to put on a pro event in Ontario uh, for various political reasons, either greed or uh, just certain parties not wanting MMA to become to have a large presence in Ontario pro MMA, and it never really it never really caught up. Um, a lot of the great fighters come from. Uh, not from Ontario. It's not Ontario is not like the center of the universe of Canada, but I mean that's where we thought a lot of the talent would come from. But even in Montreal, we just did not, which is you know where GSP came from, where we saw a lot of great fighters uh, started tra- trained out of there. Rory's from the the other coast actually, um, and that's where you still see a lot of fighters come from, like maybe Alberta and in that direction, closer in that direction. But man, we thought Ontario uh, was going to be a, a home base for, it, and it just didn't happen. And we're still waiting. We're still waiting for that boom to come. And I'm confident. I, I think it'll happen. I think it'll happen. We now have a new um, a Ministry of Sport initiative trying to get the amateur scene kind of pumped back up again. So 297 was a part of that, like bring the UFC back to Canada, get people sort of peaking their interest again. But uh, it's a big climb, guys, a big climb. And I, I do not, I feel comfortable throwing a name out there and saying this person is going to be like a UFC top five contender um, anytime soon. All right, Thank last you. Two that. super chats, and then we're we're getting out of here. Uh, Sage is in the same spot at UFC 200 as Bo. I mean, it was on the prelims, but yes. And he fought Enrique Marin, went to the cards. I don't know if this is going to go to the cards. I would assume not. Uh, who's your favorite current champion? Oh. Golly. Uh. I don't it? know. That's a good question. I never really yeah, think like about that. Like, now, are we talking? Is fun. Are we talking like who's your favorite like fan uh, kind of answer, or are we talking like who's your favorite to watch? I mean, like, how are you? It can't be this? fan because I I can't answer it as a fan. Oh, I can. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I it's probably can. Alex. Per- it's probably Alex Pereira because I it's just such so freaky and so strange, and the fact that he's even in this position is so bizarre. Yes, so quickly. So, yeah, I'll mm. say him just because his story is incredible. But what do you got, Rick? Rick? I mean, John Jones is always my guy, like forever and ever and ever. I'll always want John Jones. But the favorite to watch right now, Ilya, is, is Alessandre Pantoja, man. Yeah, that Pants, dude's the yeah. freaking best. Yeah. That dude is Pants the freaking is best. Every single fight is just a banger. He's so well rounded. He goes into zombie mode. He guts it out with slugfest, or he's just a, a ace grappler. Like he for for my money, if I'm if in a vacuum, if, if in a vacuum, the UFC says like you can pay right now to watch any of these champions fight right now. Opponent in relevant of opponent, you're just gonna see a fight from this person. It might still be John Jones, just because you know it's toward the end and he's a legend and all that stuff and he's the goat. Uh, but Alessandro Pantoja is getting my money, man. That dude's that dude's incredible. I love him. Pants is fun as hell. AK, why is it Raquel Pennington for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's just she's phenomenal. Right? Uh, ask me in a year. It could be Elliot Topuria. It could be Elliot Topuria. I think the guy is just so one. intriguing, and he just did that thing we always ask, that we ask him that the UFC begs for, where you when you are given an opportunity, can you capitalize it, capitalize on it in the most dramatic, meaningful way? And holy crap, he did it! Huge knockout. Uh, and then uh, getting to do, uh, you know, uh, the Brenna Bayou appearance was freaking insane. It's kind of still surreal to think about. We probably didn't cover it enough, frankly. Um, and yeah, and even before that, his fights were so fun. So it's a little bit too early. We've only seen him in one championship fight. I get it. But uh, boy, a year from now, that could be the answer for a lot of people. TDP is fun as hell to watch. <laughs> yeah, he is. Uh, last one, Giovanni. Will the UFC bury Grant Dawson after his loss to Bobby Green wrote, he's tough for grapplers, not named Bo Nickel. Uh, he's booked. So I guess you're going to get some news broken to you right now, Giovanni, as well. Um, UFC 302, which is currently slated for June 1st, Year of Our Lord 2024. Looks like Newark, New Jersey. Grant Doss will be fighting one Joseph Selecki. Joe Selecki. Good match. match A fun fight. Grappler versus grappler, uh, Joe Selecki. And Grant, I believe both of these gentlemen have been 
competitors on BTL, as a matter of fact. I oh, think wow. be I wow. think this will be the first fight in UFC history with two guys who were both on BTL at different points to battle Jed Mishu, and now they're going to fight each other, and they're wow. both very, very good. Yeah, is Joe Jed is the special excellent. guest referee? No, actually, I guess you would be the referee, <laughs> and Jed would be like cornering both? I don't know how that would work. Oh, that'd be incredible. Forget, um, uh, forget the BMF some... belt. We're, we want the BTL belt. That's the one that, that they'd be fighting for. That's really I mean, cool. Forget the middleweighty middleweight title. This is this means way more. The BTL this belt. means way more. Impressive. God, now Randy Co- like Randy Cos is gonna have to fight like Adrian Yanez or something Wait. again. They did fight each other. Yeah. So then, did they did they appear after no, they fought? A- Actually, Adrian Yanez has never been on BTL. Oh, okay. Randy has. Adrian's okay. been on the watch party, been on BTL, mm. but these are actually BTL competitors. Uh, there is one more, last one. There should be more draws in MMA, like OSP versus Inchukwu. Should that have been nah, a draw? Nah, OSP no. won. OSP I feel won. pretty good about OSP winning that. Fight. Yeah, yeah. There should be more draws in MMA. That is correct. Yeah, there should be more draws in, in MMA. There should be more ten tens handed out. There should be more um, ten eights handed out. Although I do say, I, I mean, I've been impressed with how much they've been using it more lately. Like it seems like the the new scoring. Uh, is is working to a certain degree in in that regard, but yeah, there should there should be more draws. I agree with that. There should be more points taken for fouls. Like there's lots of paths to more draws, and there should be all of this. Don't even get me started with that <laughs> bullshit. Just cheat your ass off, guys. If you're a fighter, if you're an up and coming fighter, you want to be you 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 want to be the next big Canadian star. Cheat your ass <laughs> off because no one's gonna call it. It's against our nature. Grab, it's against our the nature. Fence, They're too nice. They're too nice. Poke them in the eye, never. kick them in the ding ding. They ain't calling anything. And it'll take 18 warnings before they do. And by the time that happens, the fight will already be over and you're getting your hand raised 29, 28 after all of those infractions. Okay. So just cheat your ass off. But hear me out. How sick would would the storyline be for like this competitor who like literally is fouling but winning these fights and just is like the ultimate villain heel who's like 10 and 0 in the ufc but he's kicked people in the nuts every single fight on route to it like that would be pretty awesome actually that's what i thought uh cameron just simon was it cameron simon <laughs> yes <laughs> he had a rough run yeah it was a good run i don't mean a rough run it was a good run he won those uh, fights just he did. Oh, he man. sure did. He That's and when they actually, t- he, he just kept getting away with it and kept getting away with it. Kept doing it into the third round. He was like the one guy who did it like just one too many in every fight. But then after it happened, he's like, ah, oh, shit. And then he just went out and finished his opponent anyways. So it didn't really matter. So he took it to the limit, went a little bit over the line, and then he just finished the fight anyways. So when you have to work a little bit harder, you just go and work a little bit harder. Fights That's next it. week. Fights next week. Cameron Simon, Peyton yeah. Talbot. There you go. That's gonna be fun. That's gonna be a fun one. But that's next week. We're done here. Uh, we have more to talk about this card, at least from a matchmaking perspective. AK, I will see you tomorrow for a, a fun edition of On to the Next One. We'll talk about what is next for Marching Tybora, for others on this card as well. Macy Chasson, Gerald Mearshart. I think you guys are going to like my Gerald Mearshart pick. I think it makes too much sense. I think it makes too much sense. But we'll talk about that tomorrow on the program and then next week it's just more fun mma hour perhaps a golf video gets dropped i don't know mark your calendars everybody stay tuned get a good night's sleep lots of content coming on your way we'll have some announcements next week as well as it pertains to the road to ufc 300 as well and i think you guys are going to like some of the stuff we're going to be doing so thank you all very much for new york rick for ak i am mike keck Have a great rest of your night. Have a tremendous weekend, everybody. (laughs) So good. So good.